Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest in our Thursday lunchtime lectures. Um, it's great to be talking to you today. Today, we are joined um, once again by Dr. Yasmin Allen from Ely Cathedral, um, sorry, not from Ely Cathedral, from the Stained Glass Museum, which is located at Ely Cathedral. Um, just a few messages for those of you who are joining us for the very first time. Um, I'm just going to share my screen so you can see some of the um, things we recommend. So um, you'll see there's been some people commenting and putting links in our description already. Please don't click them. Um, the only place you can watch our lectures is on our Facebook Live. We do record um, these lectures. So if you can't um, make them live, um, they are available for you to watch um, for free of charge afterwards. So don't click any of them, uh, those links. Um, if you have any problems such as sound, um, if you can't find the link or whatever, do um, send us a direct message. And um, one of either myself or my colleagues will be on hand to help. Now, one of the best things about these lectures is at the end of the lecture, there is ample opportunity for you to put your questions to our guest speaker. So do take up um, that opportunity and um, do comment throughout um, the lecture using the comment box um, with any questions you have. And we'll put those to um, Yasmin at the end of the talk. Um, finally, um, if you like these lectures, um, please do hit that like button, do share them with your friends and family, and do sign up for future lectures. You can find details of those other lectures on our Facebook event page and also on our website, visitchurch.org.uk. But also, please do consider making a donation to our work. We currently have a gap in our funding between um, half a million and six hundred thousand pounds, so we're trying very hard to um, plug that gap. So please do make, consider making a donation. You can text CCT to 70331 to give us a gift of £3. Um, you can also donate securely through our website, which again is visitchurch.org.uk, or you can take advantage of a special membership offer we've launched um, from as little as £3.50 a month. Um, if you join us by direct debit, we are sending um, people a copy of Beautiful Churches, which is a wonderful book, which shows um, some of the churches in our collection, which we've saved in our 50 year history. And it includes a really wonderful forward from His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. Now, I'm going to pass you over to our chief executive, Peter Ayres. Um, who's going to tell you a bit more about our work. But as I said, if you've got any questions or any problems, do send us a direct message and either myself or my team will be on hand to help you. Over to you, Peter. Hello, everybody, and thank you again for joining us. If you're coming back for part two, part one was a fabulous lecture. So part two is going to be equally, if not more fabulous than last week's. Um, and um, I just wanted, before I introduce um, Jasmine formally today, just wanted to give you a quick um, overview of the, the Church Conservation Trust, if you've never come across us before. Um, we're a charity that was set up in 1969 uh, as a genuine partnership between church and state to deal with the issue of historic churches, which no longer had viable congregations and these buildings were falling into disrepair and sometimes ruin and it was felt that something needed to be done and so ever since 1969 we've been saving um, historic places of worship right across England and we've amassed a collection of 356 of them we take on about two or three more every year and as you can imagine it's a it gets tougher to find the money all the time to do that so any of your support today would be be really really welcome um, lockdown and uh, the impact of COVID has been quite significant on the trust so we've lost quite a lot of revenue over this period because we've not been able to do events and people haven't been able to visit our sites. I'm pleased to say that around 260 of our sites are now open so please do get out there you can check on our website visitchurches.org.uk uh, to see which sites are open and we're opening more and more every day and we're really grateful to the communities and volunteers around this collection of churches for doing the effort there. We're also trying to encourage events to take place uh, obviously in an appropriately socially distanced way and there should be an interesting program for September certainly uh, and do check again on our website. Now if you're wanting to indulge in a staycation as well uh, do look at the ultimate uh, social distancing tourism product which is Champing that's right church camping champing.org sorry jamping.co.uk which is a, a product we offer so you can have a beautiful medieval church to yourself and your your group overnight uh, and uh, really spend some time appreciating these buildings and having the sun break through the stained glass windows which you're going to learn about more now uh, is one of the most fantastic experiences that's there. 
So before, um, well, so let me now introduce Jasmine to you, who's the director of the Stained Glass Museum uh, in Ely. Um, so Jasmine studied at the University of York and has published on the exhibition of stained glass in the 19th century. She's also a committee member of the Glaziers Trust, the Stained Glass Repository and the British Corpus on Vitrarium which I don't know whether I pronounced right last week, so I've probably got it wrong this week as well, but I'm sure Jasmine will correct me. Um, the Stained Glass Museum houses a national collection of stained glass from across Britain and Europe, and it's the only museum dedicated to stained glass in the UK, which came as something of a surprise to me, given the huge quantity of stained glass we have in the country, and only one of a handful of places in the world with such a broad chronological span of stained glass exhibits. What's really important is it's, that it's opened again. It's been open for a week. And um, Jasmine's just been telling me that visitor numbers are about 50% that they normally are. Um, now that's a good thing for social distancing, I suppose, but these museums really rely on people visiting, paying and donating. So please do consider, as well as the Church's Conservation Trust, please do donate also to the Stained Glass Museum. And I think Jasmine's gonna provide you with a link. But the, if you type the stainedglassmuseum.com come into Google you'll get them up and it's very easy there's a support us link there and you can donate become a friend join their mailing list as well I think it's a really important collection it has a very important story to tell and it does really need your support as well so without further ado let me pass you over for part two part one was amazing so here we go uh, part two of uh, the story of stained glass in England Jasmine Thank you, Peter. And uh, thank you to any of you who, who may have already visited us in the last week. It was great to welcome visitors. Um, but yes, it's also been a challenging time for us at the museum. Right, just going to share my screen. Um, hopefully you can all see that now. Last week, we looked at the earliest stained glass, some of the earliest stained glass to be found in the UK, right up to the Reformation. And this uh, week, Today, we're going to look at the subsequent period from the Reformation to the present day. Um, but we're going to pick up where we stopped last week, um, especially for those who, who may not have joined last week, um, at St Mary's Parish Church in Fairford in Gloucestershire, which is a late medieval church um, rebuilt in the early 16th century, funded um, almost entirely by a, a very wealthy woolen cloth merchant, um, John Tame and his son. And it has a complete set of late medieval windows that were likely made by a foreign glazier. It's quite rare that there's such a scheme like this uh, that survives at Fairford and there's one or two other places. And I just want to start by looking at one of those windows in a bit more detail to show you the transition of the late medieval to the Renaissance style. So this is early 16th century glass. This is a window at the east end of the south aisle in Fairford Church. And it depicts the Noli Mitangere, the transfiguration and the appearance to the three Marys. So Christ appearing to the three Marys at the tomb. And a couple of things I just wanted to point out about this is, a, the window is rather large. You can see the uh, mullions, the stone compartments are dividing the glass into several different panels. And the tracery lights at the top are also quite complex in their shape. This is perpendicular uh, Gothic. And throughout the medieval period, the evolution of Gothic architecture meant that stained glass artists were more and more challenged to fill these ever increasingly complex windows with stained glass. And here, as the, the Gothic architecture has kind of expanded, grown, got more complicated with more openings, you can see that what the artist has done is to start to treat it more like a canvas with images that spread from one part of the window to the next. So you can see that there's these millions that, that stand in the middle of a scene, but it's actually the, the same scene. So that's one thing. We also have the introduction of perspective. If you look at that scene on the left, we've got this receding perspective in the, the floor line and, and then the vaulted ceiling, which gives you that depth that uh, exists in, in Renaissance art, but not so much in medieval art. So we're, we're looking really at the, the evolution of art in stained glass here as well. And the introduction of landscapes. 
So in the back on the right hand side there, you can see that there's quite a complex landscape. Again, in the background, um, there's a perspective in that window. And this is very different from the medieval glass of the, the 13th and 14th century, which was predominantly um, surrounded by Gothic frame, kept within each light um, and you know, individual figures. This is seen spread across the lights. Now, a few decades later, after this glass was made, the Reformation um, occurred in, in England, and obviously it had started by this time um, on the continent. And the Reformation, as we, we said last, last week, the English Reformation, it was a long process, actually. Uh, we should point that out. I mean, a bit like Brexit is going to be a long process. So was the English Reformation, the break of the Church of England from Rome. And this is a, a rather wonderful uh, painting. It's actually an Elizabethan painting, which is in the National Portrait Gallery, and it's entitled Edward VI and the Pope. Um, Henry VIII is often the figure that's associated with the Reformation, and he, of course, did get the ball rolling, and he closed all the monasteries and brought about these injunctions of the 1530s, which talked about images in churches, but actually did not mention stained glass specifically. But it was under Edward VI's reign, um, and he's the son of Henry VIII, where a new injunction um, of 1547 actually singled out imagery in windows um, for the first time. And, and I put the passage at the bottom there um, so you can see that there's instructions to destroy all shrines, coverings of shrines, tables, candlesticks, blah, 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 so that there remain no memory of the same in walls, glass windows or elsewhere within their churches or houses. So glass windows is mentioned there. And, and that's quite significant because we think most of the damage brought upon windows during the Reformation period was actually during this period of the 1540s onwards. And this painting shows you very nicely. Henry VIII is in bed there in his deathbed and he is passing the baton to the boy king Edward VI seated, seated on the throne there and you can see uh, the Pope at the bottom uh, being defeated if you like. So the period that followed this was, was rather tumultuous for stained glass um, but there wasn't one single approach to removing imagery. Different approaches were taken all over the country. Some stained glass windows were replaced with clear glass, so plain glazing. Some we think were whitewashed over, so the stained glass actually remained in the windows, but they were kind of covered, uh, so they weren't visible and no longer causing offence. Others were taken out and kept for spares or repairs. Some may have been hidden, um, and others were smashed either entirely or partly. And of course, we know that uh, from the evidence we have, certainly certain images were attacked more than others, and figures um, and faces and hands were deliberately targeted. Now, under Elizabeth's rule, Elizabeth I, um, she passed some new royal injunctions in 1559, which interestingly added a clause about preserving or repairing windows, um, which might be seen to, to to be interpreted as preserving the imagery, but it, but it wasn't really about preserving the imagery in stained glass. It was more about practical considerations. If you think about these very big churches with large windows, if they were all smashed and churches didn't have the money to replace or repair, then it's going to cause problems for the building and the people in it. So there's some practical considerations there um, that were taken. So you could repair a hole in a window, um, but really, there were no new windows um, put in in this period, or, or very rare that was, because stained glass was no longer um, an, an item, a decoration, uh, a devotional object that people had in their churches. One of the ways in which the art of stained glass survived then um, was through depicting and painting things like heraldry, which was never as uh, contentious as religious images. And here you can see in Stillingfleet Church in the East Riding, we have some 16th century 
arms, which have actually been renewed in the 17th century. So um, valued, if you like, within that church. And that, and that tells us a lot. It tells us that people were caring for some of the painted and stained glass in their buildings. But it also tells us that often those windows that were cared for um, were perhaps because they were associated with landed families of the area and because they did not pose um, any kind of iconoclastic uh, threat. They weren't religious images, um, it wasn't idolatry. But in the late 16th and early 17th century, really, um, very little was happening. And it was not long that the, the Civil War in the 1640s meant that um, there was a lot more destruction brought about on churches. There are, of course, always exceptions, and forgive my broad brush um, of the, the Reformation there and its effect on stained glass. It is actually uh, more complicated. We don't know as much as we would like to, um, but this, this period we do have a few examples where, where we know stained glass windows were put in, in in the 1630s and 40s. This is an interesting example thought to have been made around 1640 in the church at Messing in Essex, which is attributed to Abraham Van Ling. And it, it shows um, it, it's, a, it's a religious window, if you like, but it's, it's actually the acts of mercy again. So here we are, um, the hungry being fed, the thirsty uh, being given water, a stranger uh, letting you, you in to, to, to stay. Uh, I was naked and clothed. Um, so it's religious message, but actually there aren't um, many religious figures in the actual window. And again, in the tracery there, uh, these are uh, actually allegories. So uh, allegory of, of hope, faith and, and charity. Um, it's not the religious figures that we were looking at in the medieval period, angels, figures of God, Christ in majesty, etc. But some really fantastic glass painting here and those who were here last week will see the, the difference in the techniques. This is on the whole um, entirely painted glass. Remember paint was always used in, in medieval uh, windows but predominantly the colour of medieval windows comes from the glass itself, this pot metal coloured glass. Here we have some pot metal coloured glass, the, the blue um, cloak round the, the the bottom half of this figure on the right is certainly blue glass as is the green drapery that he's he's carrying but then the wishy-washy greens and blues that you see in 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 the background that's uh part enamel color a, a color which is applied to the glass and then fired and part silver stain uh, that yellow stain which which stains the glass is made from a silver compound Enamel painted glass is very, very popular in this period, and, and there are lots of reasons why that might be. Um, partly it was a technical development that was favoured by the artists who were increasingly uh, looking to create more painterly windows. And partly also it may be to do with the supply of coloured glass, which was halted actually um, in the, the 1630s, the war between Louis XIII of France and Duke Charles IV of Lorraine in 1633 meant that the glass houses of Lorraine in, in that region um, were, were actually destroyed. And we think that most coloured glass at this time was purchased from the continent. So it, it meant that there was less coloured glass um, for windows like this. So a combination of techniques uh, of reasons why these techniques became quite popular um, and you can tell that it's painted uh, enamels if you look at the lead lines because around a coloured piece of glass you will always have a complete lead line holding that piece of glass in whereas if you look at the landscape in the background there um, you can see that it's it's basically rectangular panes of clear glass which have been painted uh, to, to look like mountains and buildings. You've got a kind of black pigment and a blue enamel paint there. And the enamel paint is actually ground up blue glass. This blue is, is made from ground up blue glass um, mi mixed together and uh, applied and then fired in the kiln. So it does fix in the kiln just like uh, normal pigment does, but it's coloured. 
So as I said, in the 17th century, not much stained glass going into churches at, at all, really. And those that windows that do go in tend to have been actually in educational colleges and, and private chapels. There's not so much 17th century glass in parish churches in, in England at all. Um, where there is, sometimes you will get panels like this, like this sundial, which, you know, is, is really a, a wholly secular, uh, quite practical uh, subjects, but there are quite a few sundials dating to this period, and this one is in Merton Church in Norfolk. And here um, I mentioned the Civil War, and it's it's it caused further attacks on idolatry um, when when the Civil War started. And there's a really fascinating window in uh, Farndon Church in Cheshire, which actually commemorates the soldiers that were involved in, in some of the battles um, during the Civil War. Um, and you can see here, I hope, from these details, some of that. Chester was a royalist stronghold which suffered a, a major siege from 1643 until um, its defenders were defeated in, in 1645. And one of them, William Barnston, who died in 1664, commissioned this small window in the parish church, and it is quite small, to commemorate his part in the siege. And you've got 20 individual rectangular panes here, which are all painted with uh, glass paint, silver stain, and some blue enamel color, um, showing the figures uh, who I guess were involved in, in the battle and they're wearing their armor. You've got pikemen and musketeers um, in all these familiar positions, which we, we know were the drill positions. Um, for, for the, the soldiers, as well as musicians and Barnston himself. So we have this continuing tradition of um, self-commemoration, which we also saw in the medieval period here in this 17th century window, um, which is actually a really fascinating uh, historical artwork um, and, and quite rare in stained glass, this kind of, of subject. And I'm grateful to Dr. He uh, Penny Hegbin Barnes for uh, introducing me to this window. Moving into the 18th century, there's a, a few more su surviving examples. Um, this is a, a really quite fascinating church in Great Whitley in Worcestershire, um, which actually has uh, 10 large stained glass, pan stained glass windows um, that depict religious scenes. And the windows were made in 1719 to 21, but they were actually commissioned and made for a private chapel um, in Ed the private chapel of Lord Chandos, and were then later purchased by Lord Foley and placed in the new parish church at Great Whitley in Worcestershire, and the church was consecrated in 1735. You can see it's a very unusual parish church because it's in the kind of late Baroque style um, that looks a bit like a, a kind of southern German or Italian church, it doesn't look like an English parish church at all, it's in that style, so it's quite unusual. And we have these 10 stained glass windows that we use to adorn the church. And they were actually um, made by Joshua Price um, from designs by an Italian artist um, who we think was Francesco Slater. So the, the interesting thing here again is you see that this is a large window, a um, mix of pot metal coloured glass and also enamel painting on glass. But the window is constructed through small uh, panes of glass and the lead lines really um, are the, a grid, a grid holding each of those panes together um, with the odd exception of a lead line following a figure. So it's a really quite different aesthetic to the medieval glass and it looks very much like a panel painting or a canvas painting um, which is entirely what they were intended to look like. And this is really the style of the 18th and very early 19th century stained glass and we call it a kind of pictorial style because it looks like a picture. Another great place to see a window um, in this style is in central Birmingham actually in the jewellery quarter, St Paul's Church, um, where we have this late 18th century window depicting the conversion of St Paul, the um, saint who the church is, is dedicated to. Again, it's a, 
large window which is divided into a grid of clear panes of glass which have been painted with enamels and stains and then fired in the kiln to fix the paint and the whole window here has quite a moody dramatic effect it's quite dark and this is really how the late 18th century church looked and i believe there were actually curtains originally um, around the the altar so it was even more theatrical and spectacular this was made by glass painter francis Eggington, but it was made to the designs of Benjamin West, who was uh, a president of the Royal Academy before Joshua Reynolds. So he was a, a painter who had uh, drawn the window, designed the window kind of as a painting, and it was then um, translated into glass by Francis Eggington. And of course, the whole surround there the, of the window and, and the kind of reredos structure behind the, the altar is in a very uh, more classical style than Gothic, which was, which was more popular at this time. Which brings us into the kind of early 19th century, which really started to rail against that kind of classical pictorial window. Um, Augustus Welby Northmore Pugin may be a name familiar to, to many of you. He was a real advocate for a return to the Gothic style and I'm showing you here some illustrations from his publications which serve to demonstrate his point that the Gothic style and if you look at that uh, image in the middle there is far more suited to worship, much more beautiful and appropriate for a holy building than what he thought was gaudy and horrible and rather secular uh, baroque altar on the right there. You can see quite clearly and poignantly in this image his preferred style and the, the differences between and of course one includes stained glass and one doesn't and it's the gothic uh, medieval example that does. Now what you see on the left here is how he saw the uh, Reformation, the effect of the Reformation on the church. And these are all images of the east end of the church, which is important because we talked about this uh, last week, the east end being in the chancel, where the altar is, where the mass is celebrated, the Eucharist, um, and that is a really significant sacrament. It's a reminder of the Christ's death, it's where communion takes place and it's a focal point of the church and it always has been. But he saw that that had been desecrated, that, that an altar, you know, the holy table had become a kind of bench, a wooden bench that you see there. And there's even a bottle under the bench in that left hand scene. You can also see that the glass has some fragments remaining, but on the whole has been destroyed and that there was a sculptural reredos behind the altar which has been hacked away and these big commandment panels which have been put up on the left. So those who visit churches a lot will probably have seen all three of these uh, examples in, in various churches, but Pugin's aim and those that followed him was really to restore the parish church to its medieval glory um, and its medieval aesthetic. And this was a, a political, and a, a religious move. And in the 1840s we start to see that in the stained glass which starts to appear more gothic again and this is the success of Pugin and many others who are advocating for the gothic style which is, is becoming more and more fashionable. And this is an interesting window at Aylsham in Norfolk um, dates to 1842, by a local glazier, Yarrington of Norwich, and you can see that we have again these figures under canopies. But it's a bit of a mix, we have some kind of gothic canopy over the, the top there, but in the tracery lights we've got renaissance surrounds. So this is very much an early 19th century blend of styles. Um, quite rare to see now because they were mostly replaced by later 19th century windows but you can see that transition here. Now because medieval buildings and medieval glass were, were being more valued we have some incredible collections in our parish churches of continental medieval glass. We talked last week about the earliest 
uh, English glass in churches, we actually have examples of 12th century French glass in our churches, but it wasn't put there until uh, the 18th or 19th century. So here is just to show you some of that, um, that central image in the mandola there with the, the head with the red um, halo around it. That is thought to be related to the glass at Saint Denis in France, some of the earliest stained glass of the Gothic era, which actually dates to the 12th century. So very, very early indeed. And actually all of these panels are um, French panels from the 12th and 13th century, which were purchased with a, a whole batch of glass from the um, patrons of the church, who were the Dowager Countess of Pembroke and her son, Sidney Herbert. They were very, very wealthy um, individuals and they assembled this whole collection of glass um, for their new church, which is an, a very interesting building in the Italian style. And these collections of um, glass from the continent, where did they come from? Why did they appear? Um, well, it was during the secularization of France following the French Revolution and the subsequent Napoleonic Wars that a lot of churches in, in France and Northern Europe were closed and there they were stripped of their furnishings. And the glass was sold often to dealers um, who then supplied wealthy uh, antiquarians in, in England to, with, with the glass that they purchased from them. So we have quite a lot of these amazing collections and this shows the increasing interest again in medieval glass and uh, old glass actually because they didn't always discern the difference between 13th and 14th century for example. At the same time artists and architects started to appreciate the glass that was left following the, the Reformation and the Civil War um, in their churches. So here we have some medieval fragments which remain in a church which have been reassembled together. Um, even though they're quite small fragments, um, they've been kind of protected in this way by being brought back together and the borders and the tops and bottoms, these diamond quarries are actually 19th century uh, surrounds which have been made to, to put the windows together. So this is a very basic kind of appreciation of those fragments, which had been for several centuries kind of neglected. And this increasing interest in the, the medieval survivals uh, um, of stained glass in, in the parish church also led to uh, changes in conservation practice. And Sarah Brown has written um, a lot about this. But here we have at Staple Morton in Berkshire. Um, you can see here a illustration by Charles Winston, which um, on the left of this panel, as it was when he saw it in 1858, and um, it was restored. So those missing heads, which you can see as blanks in that drawing would have been um, as a result of the Reformation and perhaps the Civil War too. And here, here is the panel today. So they filled in those blanks, um, but were quite sensitive about how they did that. And we start to see, because of this increasing interest in the medieval period, imitations of medieval styles in 19th century windows. And any of you who've, who've visited the churches will have seen countless windows in these Gothic styles, of which there are very, very different types of Gothic styles. Here's an example which looks very much like a, a kind of 13th or 14th century window by Willamont in Newton on Ouse. And this practice of having a uh, scene and a medallion with a grisaille panel above and below um, was first introduced in the uh, 13th century, in the late 13th century, and you can see that in, in York Minster. So they're using techniques, they're using colours, and they're using styles and drawing that, that was very popular in the medieval period. You know, we've lost the sense of perspective here, or if there is perspective, it's very slight. It's much more two-dimensional and medieval. We've got the red and blue colours which were always popular from the early medieval period onwards. And this was an enormous area of church building uh, as well as restoration. So there was a lot of work for stained glass artists because everyone wanted to have stained glass in their churches again. It was an era of much beautification and decoration of, of churches. And we have a lot of that um, that still survives 
archives. So there were many, many stained glass studios that were founded in the 1840s and 50s, some of whom went right up to working until the mid 20th century and had a very long legacy. Willamont was one of the kind of fathers, if you like, of the Victorian stained glass industry because it really was an industry with um, large studios employing uh, more than 100 uh, workmen at a time. And the subjects of 19th century glass vary enormously just like they did in the medieval period but we also have a lot of commemorative windows following on from that great long tradition and this is an interesting one in Wellersbourne in Warwickshire which is actually a memorial uh, to someone who who died during the Crimean War and as the inscription uh, says there quite quite sadly um, this young man actually died three days from Malta on board a ship and was buried at sea. He was only 19 years old. So you can imagine that his family on hearing this news um, were able to put up this window as a memorial, which clearly uh, in includes a portrait of him shown there being held by an angel. That's a very Victorian um, interpretation of, of death and, and resurrection that it was a comfort to them to, to do this. And a lot of windows put up in this period were paid for, again, by wealthy individuals and sometimes groups of people who weren't so wealthy, um, so subscription windows. And many of them were memorials. Popular medieval subjects also um, became popular once again in the 19th century. We, we saw some quite incredible medieval last judgments last week. Well, here's a 19th century one by the uh, well-known studio Clayton and Bell, who produced some fantastic glass, especially in the 1850s and 1860s. And I really love the, the colouring of these windows. You've got some really fantastic purples and turquoises adding to the colour palette um, and this colour glass of course wouldn't exist in the medieval period but by the mid 19th century they had really started to uh, make all sorts of new colours. You get these very bright um, sweet box colours and some really gorgeous turquoises and purples. So this is a, a Victorian depiction of the Last Judgment and it's slightly more saccharine than the medieval versions. You can see that even the people who um, are, are being sent to hell here um, are, are semi-clothed um, and it, it's, it's slightly, I think, less terrifying than, than the medieval versions, but nonetheless very important part of the, the Victorian church to think about heaven and hell, to think about judgment. Um, so that very much continued. I managed to squeeze in a Church's Conservation Trust here, um, which I was fortunate to visit last year, actually. Um, this is All Souls Church in Halifax, which has a fantastic array of Victorian glass. And it's a Victorian building. It was designed by um, Gilbert Scott, one of the great Victorian architects. And this is an excellent demonstration of, um, in this era, the new church building, how the stained glass artists worked closely with the architects. Various makers actually produce windows for this church, but this east window, I think, is, is Hardman and Company of Birmingham, who were very, very accomplished. Um, and and it's, it's, it's a lovely balanced window, which again uh, makes an acknowledgement of the Gothic outline of the window um, to kind of create these figures which are separated, but also very cohesive as a whole. But it's not a panel painting where a scene is, is wishy-washy across the whole window. It's much more um, observant to the architecture. A firm that will be very familiar to many of you is Morris and Company, um, founded by William Morris and uh, a group of people, um, including the architect Philip Webb and the artist Ford Maddox Brown. Um, and Morris, Marshall and Faulkner and Company, as they were known when they were established in 1861, did mark a move away from this Gothic revival style that we've been uh, looking at. And it was honouring a medieval tradition, but actually produced a slightly new aesthetic. And the colouring 
is uh, slightly toned down as well. We have, um, just as the transition from the 13th to the 14th century, um, from the 1850s to the 1860s, we start to see the introduction of more kind of natural colours, the, the darker greens, the ochres. It's slightly more subdued and a lot more white or clear glass. Now they're very well known partly because Edward Burne Jones, the, the Victorian painter uh, influenced by the Pre-Raphaelites, one of the Pre-Raphaelites who designed stained glass almost exclusively for the firm for, for a long time. And, and this is one of his earlier windows designed for the firm at Lyndhurst, which has an incredible um, range of windows if you're down that way in Sussex. And Morris, Morris Glass kind of, um, they continued right into the 20th century and, and I'm sure it would be very familiar to you, the, the use of kind of foliage backgrounds and the move away from Gothic architecture. Alongside that, of course, other studios carried on working in a very traditional uh, Gothic revival style. But again, there was a shift in colour tones and you can see here again, the more muted colour palette and more white glass. This is a, a really interesting window which speaks volumes of the Victorian Church and the British Empire. Um, it's the Jubilee of Nations window from Great Malvern Priory, which was made by um, Cam Brothers in, in Smethwick. And it includes actually a portrait of Queen Victoria um, on, her, on her coronation because it's a Jubilee window celebrating that occasion. But above, the lights above, you not only have Christ, but the whole world as depicted through the lens of the British Empire. So you have stereotypes, um, the, the African who here is depicted as a slave uh, kneeling on the right, um, the, the Indian, uh, etc. It's quite uh, abhorrent by 21st century standards, but certainly a 19th century view of the world uh, through the British Empire lens, which of course is very problematic. But these are very interesting windows which, which demonstrate um, the place of the church in that history actually, in the history of the British Empire and the monarch as well. Now this is, this is very, very late Victorian, early Edwardian sentimental window, but exquisitely made. Um, it's a memorial window, you can probably see that, uh, paid for by a husband um, who, and, and in memory of his, his wife, and perhaps also uh, her, their children, because you can see these angels above all have the faces of children, they're certainly portraits, um, and she is shown on her deathbed and he is shown grieving by her, his, her side. It's a very powerful uh, memorial, but something more affected than we, we might be used to in stained glass. But there are lots of examples of this very personal uh, memorial windows that were, were very popular in the late 19th century and, and part of um, the culture of mourning in the Victorian period. And this is in the, the family chapel, of course, in Osset in uh, Essex. Osset, I think it actually is. Had to squeeze in a window from the, the Stained Glass Museum because we're a bit light on that uh, in, in this lecture. I'm not sure why I didn't include more. Um, but here's one to entice you. Uh, and it's made by a female artist because by the late 19th century, women stained glass artists were certainly practicing. And this is a window that's inspired by the arts and crafts movement, um, which actually moved away from the kind of mass large studio production of stained glass and was more about one individual being involved in the making of the window from design to finish. And this was in a parish church um, in Bristol, in Clifton, Bristol, and is now in the Stained Glass Museum. And you can see that it's dated 1912, um, but it's a rather wonderful kind of glass tapestry and glass, if you like, uh, where every single piece of glass has been lovingly painted with a textural pattern um, and the whole works together rather nicely and we've got these very flowing lead lines uh, which are very very important to the kind of dynamic overall uh, window. So this is one you can see at the Stained Glass Museum. Another um, really fantastic women 
woman stained glass artist um, was Wilhelmina Geddes. Uh, she was Irish and this is one of her well-known windows at Wall's End in, in Northumberland dating to 1922 and you see really here the influence of this uh, early 20th century modernism. Uh, there's an interesting play in scale of the figures from the very large to the very small. Um, the glass that's been selected, the coloured glass, is, is of very high quality. Um, it's, it's very stylized, and again the figures are kind of placed in, in a very careful way in what's quite a, a difficult window to, to fill, and it's, it's very typical of, of Geddes's work. And this is actually a First World War memorial window, so it went in a bit later than uh, was expected, but the focus here is on Christ um, as a, a symbol for the sacrifice. There are many uh, First World War memorial windows around and, and in recent years uh, there's been a lot more research on them which is fantastic. Uh, this is another one from up north in, in Durham um, made in the studio of Lowndes and Drury and it's slightly earlier than, than the one I just showed you but here we have a portrait of a soldier um, so a very kind of realistic portrait um, in in this window where we can also see this vision of uh, the soldier's soul um, almost kind of surrounded by angels and angels wings being taken up to heaven um, side by side with the transfiguration of Christ I mean Christ uh, also went up to, to, to heaven so it's a really interesting parallel there that's being made and all sorts of um, interesting imagery in these First World War memorial windows. Uh, Douglas Strachan or Strawn, I've also heard it, it pronounced, but I think the Scottish say Strachan, he was a Scottish artist, um, was, was one of those brilliant modernists who were again influenced by these arts and crafts principles about uh, working and designing on the glass yourself using the best materials and um, he produced some fantastic windows at Winchelsea which is where this this window is in, in East Sussex he actually made nine windows which were all paid for by a very generous patron um, again they were actually given as a war memorial to the uh, towns of Bright and Winchelsea, um, but Strack and the artist was given free reign here on the subjects and there's some really quite wonderful subjects. The, the theme of this window I think is praise and resurrection and there's all sorts of figures surrounded um, in, in the window but it's, it's the archangel Michael below um, de defeating Lucifer and above um, Christ enthroned holding a kind of globe. Um, but the colours the, the lead lines, which have this really dynamic movement, um, are really, really typical of Strachan's work. And it's a fantastic parish church with, with a really quite rare scheme of, of such uh, modern windows. So this is, a, if you like, the, the, the avant-garde of, of the time. Um, 1930s glass tends to look a bit more like this. This is Christopher Webb. Um, and many other artists in this period actually uh, were, were working in a style that was much more favoured by the, the church, um, which included lots more clear glass. And you can see here that these are figures placed on diamond plain quarried glass background. Uh, so very different style. Um, there's a move here to let more light in the church and a, a preference for delicate painting and silver stain, this yellow stain on, on the white glass, rather than a window filled with, with jewel-like colour. And that's a kind of a transition that you, that you see in that period, although there are always exceptions. Just to show you another window that's just pre sorry, another church that's pre-Second World War. This is uh, St Saviour's at Eltham, which is a really quite significant um, amazing modern movement church um, made of, of brick and concrete which includes some decorative glass uh, like this in, and it's it's interesting that this is very much glass being thought about with modern architecture this is not how we we think of when we think of a parish church but there are some stunning modern examples out there 
Of course, a few years later, outbreak of the Second World War would change a lot of things. Showing you Plymouth uh, St Andrew's Church here after bomb damage in 1941. This medieval church building uh, was on fire for a long time after the, the bombs and the roof uh, has completely gone. So here we have two people looking on at the building. It was actually restored and reconsecrated in 1957. This is what the church looks like today. And I'm sure your eyes have been drawn to the very colourful windows, which were put in there from the 1960s onwards. They're actually um, designed by John Piper, the British artist, and made by the craftsman and stained glass artist he worked with, Patrick Raintons, who's still making stained glass today, and really rather vibrant. So out of the destruction of the Second World War um, also came the opportunity for post-war artists to do something a bit new, to be a bit more bold, a bit more modern. And actually we see a, a cr increase in kind of abstraction um, in this period in stained glass, which has kind of continued um, right through to today. So this is one of the, the windows in that church. It's actually the west window um, in the tower. And you need to look and spend some time looking at this glass because you get this overall impression of colour. Um, it's only when you start to look at the details and perhaps have a guide pointed out to you that you see what you're looking at, which is the, the passions of the cross. So the symbols with which uh, Christ was tortured uh, on the cross with, uh, we have the, the scourge, the dice, uh, the pincers, the ladder, um, and the ladders are actually shown here in the form of the cross of St Andrew, who is the patron saint of the church. And we have the, the cock, the cock that crowed three times. So each abstract symbol does have quite a lot of meaning, but it's slightly uh, different to reading the, the very figurative picture windows um, of earlier periods. And one of my favorite windows in the church is actually this one, which is this burst of uh, golden colour. It's in the north transept and the theme for this window was inspiration which is quite a, a grand subject and, and what does that look like? I mean anything you like but it's in memory of an organist and choir master this window so it's quite poignant here that the the only recognisable shapes are these two shapes in the centre which actually show the two earliest known drawings of harps. Um, so a very fitting subject for the, the person it's commemorating. And they're shown on this really vibrant gold background, which is, is almost entirely, I think, produced with this silver stain, this silver uh, compound, the yellow stain, which stains the glass yellow. And you can see that that goes yellow, but also orange at times, depending on how much stain there is, the temperature of the kiln, etc. You can also see in this window that it is broadly speaking, small panes of glass, a bit like some of those 18th century windows. But we have these lead lines that also interrupt that pattern that are flowing across. And if you look, they, you know, they almost look like crack lines. Uh, they're deliberate. Um, it's thinking about stained glass in an abstract way and thinking about where your eye is drawn to and how to, to make something um, look less regimented and, and more interesting. And I think that's very successful here. We're running out of time, so I'm going to just skip through. So we have only got a couple windows left. Hopefully George will let me carry on. Um, techniques changed in the second part of the Second World War as well. We have new techniques. So applique, this is glass, uh, stuck on glass in a resin frame. And this is a, a very modernist church in Letchworth, which is, is sadly uh, the congregation have had to move out actually because the, there are problems with the building. But you see it's very abstract designs made using new techniques. And the same, uh, go back to Elfin slightly later, Dal de Vere windows, which are chunks of uh, slab glass, glass that's poured into a mould um, and, and uh, faceted, held in a concrete or resin matrix. So no paint, um, no lead, it's actually very modern materials. Um, and these windows sometimes form the wall of buildings. So you, you see that more often in very 
Roman Catholic church is actually than Anglican, um, but, but they do, they are to be found in places. You'll all know the uh, famous church at Tudley, famous because it's got this set of Marc Chagall windows, fantastic spot if you're interested in 20th century glass. Um, started with a, a memorial to a young girl uh, shown here who, who died in a sailing incident um, and, and very beautiful, very different to our English glass, um, very typical of Chagall, the, the famous painter. Others like Lawrence Lee, who are more perhaps combining somewhere in between this abstract style and the figurative, um, he, he made some wonderful windows in, in the post Second World War period. And this is one from 1970 in Kent. And just to kind of bring you up to date, some, some windows that you perhaps wouldn't think were church windows at all, made by the, the very well known artist Brian Clark. These are at Birchover and they, they were given to the church by Brian Clark. And he was very influenced by German post war glass, which uh, was very abstract and often uh, um, quite geometric and you can see that in these early windows by him at Birchover. More recently um, Tom Denny is one of the the artists who, who's, who's been very successful um, in, in adopting a kind of figurative approach uh, that's very very typical to his style, um, very heavily painted and lots of layers of glass, flashed glass um, and this is a window at Tewkesbury Abbey by Tom Denny, which actually um, celebrates the monk's anniversary, the, the anniversary of the monk's arrival at Tewkesbury, so 900 years of the Benedictines um, there. And the theme is the Benedictine motto, to work is to pray. But again, this is more contemplative perhaps than illustrative. And I think uh, 21st century glass has, has gone a lot that way. So to finish, I want to just uh, show you two windows from the last decade and we're actually going to return to Northumbria where we started last week with, with some of the earliest glass uh, to look at some really fantastic examples of uh, the last decade in the same church actually. This is St John's Church, Healy, Northumberland, um, a fantastic uh, window here made by James Huguenin. Again, unlike anything um, I've seen before, very abstract but very contemplative and in the same church this this window by Anne Vibeck um, which actually is is clouds um, which have been etched into the glass using a tungsten point very very contemplative perhaps not to everybody's taste um, but very effective in in this church actually in these very small windows and, and interestingly neither artist had previous experience of stained glass. Um, so it's exciting to know that uh, the art form is still attracting uh, new artists, as well as all of those wonderful contemporary artists, which we do have a lot of uh, working up and down the country, um, producing commissions for churches when the opportunity arises, which is less often than uh, it has been in the, the early 20th century and the, the 19th century. So if you're in charge of a church, perhaps you could think about uh, whether you can raise some funds to uh, put in a new window because there's some brilliant artists out there. And I will stop there. Um, and sorry, George, for going a bit over length today. Um, and here is the link to the museum's website for those who may want to go and look up to see if they want to join the friends or, or make a donation. Um, anything you can afford would be very much appreciated and, and help us as we're moving forward. Thank you, George. Thank you so much, Jasmine. That was brilliant. And um, I know there's been some amazing comments, but as Jasmine said there, um, everyone, please do consider making a donation to the museum. Um, do go to their website. And I'm just gonna read you what their website address is. And that is the stainedglassmuseum.com. Um, there's some really good information on their website as well about sort of what you can go and see opening hours as well as how to um, support them by making a donation. Now, Jasmine, if you're okay, I'm just gonna dive in with a couple of questions that we've had come in. So, um, thanks everyone for the questions. If you've got any more, do keep them coming. And if we can't answer them today, um, we'll try and um, send them in an email and we'll try and get back to you as soon as we can. Um, so question one was, um, are there any guides to stained glass in the UK, sort of any books that are being published that sort of really definitively um, sort of explore UK stained glass? 
There are some great gazetteers, so um, guides which you can, which divide in by county by county what you can see. Um, so I recommend for that, uh, there's a Peyton Paint Cowan, it's one by Peyton Cowan, and there's one by June Osborne. Um, they're the books that I tend to, to throw in the car when I'm on my way to a new county. Um, in terms of the development, um, there's a fantastic introduction to Stained Glass by Sarah Brown. Um, and others I can point you to the BSMGP website where they have a list of, of books that you may want to peruse if, if you're serious about getting some books. Brilliant. Thanks for that Jasmine. Um, question number two, um, you showed some really amazing drawings there of what Pugin, um, some of his designs, and one of them included um, the Royal Coat of Arms above the um, Holy Table. Um, are there examples of Royal Coat of Arms in stained glass, perhaps where the arms were changed over the years, um, where the stained glass wasn't used? <laughs> It's a good question. Um, I mean, obviously, I've seen various hatchments. Um, there are some royal arms. Um, I'm trying to, the church is trying to come to mind in that kind of 17th, 18th century period. But I don't think where they've been changed, I don't think that's very likely because um, it's quite expensive and difficult to, to do that with stained glass. It's not a matter of just painting over. Um, I'll have to have a think about where the one that I'm thinking of is, but it's it's high up uh, in, in a church that's just escaped my mind. Apologies. <laughs> that's all right. Um, I'll go on to another question. So um, someone said there, um, I seem to remember a very vivid green um, glass at Fairford. I noticed in these slides um, and in churches that green isn't used a lot. Was that because it was more difficult to make as colour? I don't, I don't know without looking at the particular green. Um, certainly glass recipes have changed over the, the period. So, I mean, you know, we, d we don't know exactly the, how medieval glass was made, what the ingredients were. Um, we can do some analysis to give us a good idea. But in the 19th century, they were all making their own recipes and using different uh, elements to, to color the glass. So, some will be more expensive than others. And I think the price of glass tends to fluctuate even today because of the changing prices of metals. Um, but it, it, it's probably not an answer yes or no, that, that one, I'm afraid. No, no, that's absolutely fine. Um, you mentioned when we were talking about William Morris, so um, someone's put in a question here. Um, the pre-Raphaelites were working in this period. Indeed, some windows in churches are the design of William Morris and Edward Byrne Jones, for example, Winchester Cathedral. How far did this movement influence church stained glass in this period, do you think? I think quite significantly. Um, my talks on 19th century glass go into this a, a bit more detail, but many of those pre-Raphaelite artists were designing for stained glass. They were interested in stained glass. And if you look at the colouring of uh, pre-Raphaelite paintings and the kind of themes that they're interested in, and then look at a pre-Raphaelite inspired stained glass window um, you can really see a lot of parallels there there's some great books on this subject recent books by uh, William Waters and Alastair Carew Cox who, who talk about pre-Raphaelite stained glass um, and I should say pre-Raphaelite stained glass uh, because they're, they're people who are influenced by the pre-Raphaelites Thank you for that, that book suggestion Jasmine um, so this is a bit of a tricky one um, but um, if someone went into a church um, and they saw some glass there um, in the wall, what, you know, what are the brief hints you could give to them um, to distinguish whether it's 19th century or medieval? What should they look out for? They're all difficult questions, aren't they? Um, this, there are some things you could look out for. Um, medieval glass will probably show some signs of corrosion. Um, so that may give it away, but I have to say that some 19th century windows that were poorly fired also show some signs of corrosion. Often if you're looking at a window where there's bits of medieval and bits of modern, if the more you look, the more you can see the kind of cleaner, fresher pieces um, compared to the, the slightly older pieces. Uh, you might notice a difference in the way that a head over there is painted and a head over there. Um, these windows, of course, can be completely taken apart and put back together again. So you don't always know by looking. And I have to say that even medieval historians can be fooled at first glance looking at a window and think it's all, it's all genuine medieval because the 19th century and early 20th century um, makers were very good at imitating and matching. Brilliant. Thanks, Jasmine. I think this is a really interesting question to finish on. Um, does anyone know how much medieval glass 
was lost in the Victorian period. When they removed glass, you know, when they removed the glass to replace it, basically. I know Morris and Co got a conscience about this and stopped removing glass to replace it with their own. Yeah, Morris and Co started to, they decided not to, to make windows for old buildings uh, anymore as well. Um, although they had already kind of contravened that a little bit. Um, how much was lost? Some was lost, especially in the early period. Uh, early conservation approaches were, were certainly not how they'd be approached now. So sometimes that was a matter of replace the old because the old is degraded and you can't see it very well. And so they thought the best thing to do was to put in a shiny new, new window. We wouldn't do that now. You'd always try and preserve the, the old pieces as much as possible. In terms of the quantity, I, I couldn't say, uh, but but certainly it would have been fairly common in, in the early period. But I think that changed quite quickly when people started to, to realise the, the value of these fragments. Um, it's still today, of course, problematic if a window is there and it's not visible because the paint has been lost or it's corroded. Um, that can be seen quite an eyesore and, and it's still today a, a problem for conservators and uh, people working in the conservation trade to kind of work out what the best thing to do because if a window is not performing its function anymore um what do you do do you preserve it anyway because it's it's old or do you actually replace it with something that that is, is more attuned to worship and um, that those conversations still happen today thank you Yasmin. i think that's really actually quite an interesting point to finish on so um Thank you for um, obviously the two part series. Um, if you missed episode one, um, please do look in the description and we'll be putting a link into part one um, where you can watch it again free of charge. Um, please do um, go onto the Stained Glass Museum's website, look at their opening hours, do go and pay them a visit. It's very, very well worth um, going up to Ely um, to spend the day and have a look around. Do give them a donation, but also do please consider making a donation towards our work. Um, do text CCT to 70331 to give a gift of three pounds. Um, next week, we're going to be joined um, once again by Dr. Christina Welch from the University of Winchester, who's going to be talking to us about erotic death art. And with that, we're going to be looking at the gender of death, um, death and the maiden. So when you go into some of our churches, you'll find there's some very interesting images or paintings on our wall paintings um, depicting death. And we'll be looking at why um, typically um, death is depicted as a male. So join us at 1pm next Thursday um, for that fascinating talk but do look on our events page and um, we've added upcoming lectures on there and um, do look on our website which is visitchurch.org.uk again for further details about our lectures but do let us know in this comment box and um, do comment below if you've enjoyed today's lecture let us know if this was your first time and also let us know about topics that you'd like us to feature in this series um, but once again thank you so much for joining us and thank you um, to Jasmine from the Stained Glass Museum for joining us today. Thanks George.